Cluster B personality disorders are characterized by dramatic, overly emotional, and unpredictable thoughts and behavior. From Ars Longa Media, this is Cluster B, scientifically informed, expert insights into the four Cluster B personality types, antisocial, borderline, narcissistic, and histrionic personality disorder. Here's today's host, Dr. Todd Grande. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today, I wanted to answer a question I received about narcissism, specifically trait narcissism, and whether or not people choose to have this trait. Now, narcissism is a bit different than the personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder. We could think of the personality disorder as extreme, grandiose, narcissistic traits. But really, of course, one way to think of it is narcissism is on a continuum, and everyone is narcissistic, but the levels can reach a pathological point. And sometimes we call that narcissistic personality disorder. But either way, pathological narcissism is destructive. It comes with a lot of consequences. So this is an interesting question. Do people choose to be narcissistic? So when we think of trait narcissism, we could think of it, again, as a personality construct. And this leads us to something like the five-factor model, where you have these five traits And you can look at narcissism and you can see what these traits and facets, and you could look at it and say, well, it's a combination of these scores on certain facets, maybe some other characteristics, and that leads to narcissism. That's what we call narcissism. For example, low agreeableness, low trust, which is a facet of agreeableness, would point toward narcissism, but you would need more than just one facet score. Again, it's a combination of facets. So if we think of this way, narcissism is a personality trait. Then the question really becomes, can we choose our personality? If somebody can choose to be narcissistic, they could choose to be agreeable. Now, again, agreeableness isn't necessarily the opposite of narcissism, but that's one way to look at it. That's one set of characteristics that doesn't seem to align with narcissism. It seems to be in the other direction. So looking at it this way, it seems pretty clear that there is no choice to become narcissistic, just like there's no choice to become conscientious or extroverted or neurotic or any of the other personality traits. We have different circumstances that occur. We have the genetic predisposition and certain things that happen in the environment. And really, we believe these factors lead to narcissism as well as other personality traits. Now, with specifically narcissism, it's a little unusual in the sense that a lot of times with personality traits, the kind of the default theory is that 50% of the contribution is genetic and 50% is what happens to the person we call environmentability. With narcissism, the research is a little mixed. We see the genetic component recorded in studies as low as 25% and of course, all the way up to 50%. So it may be that narcissism more so than other personality traits, whether or not they're aligned with personality disorders at any level, may have a lower genetic component And what happens to a person, the environment, may play a larger role. So let's think about this in terms of how can personality form? How can the environment shape personality? Well, personality is a fairly complex construct, including this trait of narcissism. But we could look at it as a tendency to engage in certain behavior, a tendency to have certain types of thinking, and a tendency to have certain emotions. So, for example, low agreeableness would be somebody who doesn't trust a lot. That would be one of the areas I mentioned. And that's a thought and to some extent a feeling. And of course, that can manifest as a behavior. If we look to a trait like openness to experience, one of the qualities we see here is being imaginative, being creative. Well, again, that's a thought to some extent, a feeling, and that can manifest as people being interested in art and other imaginative type adventures. So we can see the behavior, the affect, that's the feelings, and the cognition, the thoughts, in all of these different personality traits. So one can make the argument that personality is really just the lens through which we see the world. This lens can be clear or it can be distorted. So the thoughts perhaps come first, maybe those lead to feelings, and maybe the thoughts and the feelings together lead to behaviors. There's all kinds of different theories about what characteristics influence other characteristics. But either way, this is, to some extent, a lens through which 
we see the world. So do we get to pick this lens? Do we get to, at some point in our lives, have some sort of neutral position and look at all of the personality traits and say, I want to be more talkative. So I'm going to pick something from extroversion. I want to be more concerned about other people. So I might pick something from conscientiousness. I want more conscientiousness. Perhaps I want to have more stable emotions. So I'll look for lower neuroticism. Well, this just isn't how personality works. We don't have some sort of neutral position, some sort of position absent of personality, and then we can go pick what we want. To some extent, we can influence our personality by engaging in behaviors and trying to have adaptive responses, meaning to think certain thoughts when certain things happen. But to a large extent, personality is not in our direct control. So as I mentioned, it would appear there is no neutral position. We don't get to, from some perfect, unbiased vantage point, select our personality characteristics. So this is the same for narcissism. We don't get to pick how narcissistic we are. So if we don't choose narcissism, then how do people become narcissistic? Well, there are a lot of different theories here. And again, there's that genetic component. But I want to focus on just a few specific areas that I think really speak to the idea of how narcissism forms and maybe what can be done to become less narcissistic potentially. So if we think about, again, narcissism as a trait, a trait is a tendency, again, to behave in a certain way and think a certain way and feel a certain way, and it tends to be stable over time. There's another construct called a state, and that's what we're doing right now. So even if you have a certain trait, you can choose in the moment to behave in a different way. This is a state. So what we think happens here is that states, emotional states, states of thinking certain thoughts, and even behavioral states are repeated, and these eventually turn into traits. And traits, of course, produce more states that are similar to the ones that created them. So if we think about the origins of narcissism, Really, two words come to mind in terms of early experiences, just as an easy way to remember it. One is permissiveness, and another is perfectionism. So if we think about the influence of parents and other individuals that help form somebody's social skills, like teachers, for example, in general, I just refer to this as supervision. So the supervision that a child receives is on a continuum from being permissive to demanding perfection. This is one way to look at it. So in essence, being strict, I don't mean overly strict, but just strict. So having rules that when they're violated, there's a predictable consequence. That's more or less in the middle. Some people would say strict is closer to demanding perfection, but for the way I'm talking about here, let's just think about it as in the middle. So if somebody's strict, that's generally considered a fairly good way to avoid personality problems later on. Again, not overly strict. But if somebody's too permissive, if they allow a child just to do whatever they want, that can lead to narcissism. And if somebody demands perfection, that can also lead to narcissism. And a lot of times what we see in terms of the origins of narcissism would be both of those things can occur. A parent can be inconsistent, which is also, therefore, a potential cause of narcissism. Another element I see, and this is really in some ways, I think related to being too permissive, is I think bullying can lead to narcissism. And you might say, well, wait a second, how does bullying tie in with parents who are too permissive? Well, again, I'm talking about supervisors. So this is parents and teachers and other important figures. And I think a lot of times what happens is in school environments and other environments, bullying is permitted because people are being, because supervisors are being too permissive. Bullying is allowed to start and continue, and this can lead to, again, narcissism. So bullying might be more or less an immediate cause there, at least potentially, but really it can be tracked back to a lack of supervision. Somebody was asleep behind the wheel. Somebody wasn't preventing the bullies from bullying, and that led to a person having their self-esteem challenge, a person being abused emotionally, physically. And when we see this type of abuse, what happens is that person is going to 
unconsciously employ defense mechanisms. And this is how I think narcissism really forms in a lot of cases. There is an ego that has a normal level of strength, but then it's confronted by all these challenges, by these insults and this physical harm. So unconsciously, the person develops these protective mechanisms. They have to put themselves on a pedestal. They have to think well themselves or else they're giving in to the will of these bullies. And that really makes sense. Of course, there's other directions people can go. They can become avoidant and they can start to believe the criticisms. So there are a lot of different potential personality problems that can come from bullying. Bullying is really dangerous and pernicious. I think a lot of times it's really overlooked. We see the behavior of narcissism. And of course, a lot of times people are upset by that because narcissists can be abusive and there are a lot of consequences to narcissism. But we forget that the cause could have been narcissistic behavior. Bullying is really a narcissistic behavior. So in a sense, permissiveness, perfectionism, and narcissism itself can lead to narcissism. Again, the bullies are narcissistic and the supervisors that permitted them to bully are also narcissistic in a sense because they're self-centered. They're not worried about the feelings and the well-being of somebody else. They're worried about themselves. Now, I don't think it's always malicious or intentional with poor supervision. That's just one possible way that we can see bullying really be allowed to exist, be allowed to continue without being stopped. So it's important to remember here that just because narcissism isn't a choice doesn't mean that people that are abused by narcissists have to be okay with that. They don't have to be okay with the experience of dealing with somebody who's narcissistic. It's still important to set boundaries. You don't have to allow yourself to be abused just because there is a reason, a logical reason, why the abuser became abusive in the first place. Everybody has a reason for doing things. Now, this is really separating kind of a deliberate nature from something that happens to the environment. Again, meaning the narcissism forms because of circumstances that occur. No one's really choosing to be narcissistic. But either way, you can still set boundaries. You can still decide that you don't want to interact with people who are narcissistic in certain contexts like romantic relationships or friendships. You still have, of course, the right to protect your own mental health, to seek counseling, and again, to watch how you interact with people that might be dangerous for your mental health. We can understand people. We can understand why somebody's narcissistic. We can understand why somebody abuses substances. We can understand a lot of things about people, but that doesn't mean that we have to be abused by those people. For example, with substance use disorders, those of course lead to a lot of drunk driving. We don't have to be happy with drunk driving. We can still put people in prison for driving while intoxicated. It doesn't mean we don't understand what caused it. It means we simply can't tolerate the behavior because it's too dangerous. And that's what we see sometimes with narcissism. It's a dangerous behavior, and we have to, within reason, protect ourselves and create distance and set those boundaries, like I indicated. So this is really going back to what I said earlier when I was really defending this concept of strictness, meaning being strict is good in a lot of ways. And that's what I'm really saying here. When people are dealing with individuals who are narcissistic and those individuals, the narcissistic individuals, are abusive, when that happens, we have to be strict. We have to have rules. And if those rules are broken, there's a predictable consequence. So if you tell somebody who's narcissistic that you're not going to talk to them anymore, or you're not going to talk to them for a few days if they engage in a certain behavior like condescension, then when that behavior happens, you would follow through with that punishment, in essence, that rule would be enforced. That's being strict. Being strict isn't bad. Being permissive can lead to problems. And demanding that somebody is perfect can lead to problems. But I'm actually a big fan of the idea of being strict in terms of maintaining good mental health. For more content like this, check out Healthy Toxic, another podcast from Ars Longa Media all about what makes or breaks relationships, including issues related to narcissism, narcissistic abuse, and how personality disorders affect relationships. Ars Longa, Vita Brevis. Learn more at arslonga.media.